Howdy guys, Jimmy Song here. Welcome to another episode of Bitcoin Tech Talk q and <clears throat> It's a show that I do every Monday uh, to review the news of the past week. And uh, this is based on the newsletter that I send out every Monday, Bitcoin Tech Talk. You can subscribe to it using the link below. Um, all right, so we got a bunch of things for you today. We got, uh, uh, you know, a bu bunch of things that uh, I wanted to talk about. But before I do that, let me just show a couple of things, let people uh, get prepped and get in here. Um, in the meantime, if you guys would, please pound that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Uh, the Little Bitcoin book is available on paperback, Kindle, and audiobook. Um, and it is uh it's uh, fairly affordable and it's a very quick read and it gives you it gives your no coiner friends a way to learn about bitcoin very very quickly um there is also the other book uh programming bitcoin this is a way to learn about bitcoin uh pretty much from scratch and you can uh buy it off of uh, amazon for forty dollars and fifty cents uh, it's uh, it's for programmers and if you are interested in learning about Bitcoin uh, from a programming perspective This is your book. Anyway um, That's what I wanted to uh, You know promote a little bit before I get into the actual stories this week um, All right, so somebody's saying my sound is super low. I don't know if that's uh, that's the case right now. Let me see um uh, that's not what I need. I need uh, the settings on this. All right, so that is the right device. So uh, let's see if any of the filters are not getting me the gain that I need. All right, so maybe maybe now it's better. I don't know. Um, all right, so I, I've uh, increased the sound. Okay, uh, all right, great. Let's uh, let's talk about uh, what's what's going on now. Um, all right, so there's obviously been a lot of money printing, uh, you know, and there's a lot of uh, degradation of civil liberties. Um, we're we're finding out, uh, you know, all sorts of things that are going on, and um, you know, in in terms of the state just sort of uh, taking powers that it really has no um, no uh, no business taking. So. Um, I, I really thought uh, Jameson Lopp's article here on uh, Bitcoin and the rise of the cypherpunks was really well timed because uh, because it really uh, does put Bitcoin in the context of what's going on and Bitcoin seems to many people um, that it's the perfect hedge against all of the stuff that's going on and it's not a coincidence that it seems that way it, the reason for the way for that is because of uh, the environment in which Bitcoin grew up. And that's what Jameson Lopp does in this article, Bitcoin and the rise of the cy cypherpunk. So let me, uh, we'll, we'll make this our long read today. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent article and we'll go over it in a bit. Um, but yeah, it, it, it covers a lot of different things and a lot of the predecessors to Bitcoin and all of that. Um, but especially in light of something like the Earn It Bill, which if you haven't read, it's absolutely frightening. Um, uh, essentially, it's, uh, it makes it so that encryption kind of becomes like illegal. So uh, Signal, for instance, is, uh, is threatening to uh, leave U.S. customers if this bill passes. And as well, they should. It's, it makes it like sort of criminal to cover anything or have any kind of pri privacy. All right, uh, so some Bitcoin news. Uh, Blockstream has released a developer preview of Simplicity, which comes with Jets. Um, and, uh, and basically, uh, Jets are Simplicity programs that are highly optimized and so on. Um, Simplicity is essentially a programming language that's purposefully not Turing complete. Um, and that makes sort of uh, uh, figuring out if a program is executing correctly and all of its conditions and all that fairly easy. Uh, so it, 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 you can prove things about the programs or the smart contracts that you essentially have to write. Um, now, I, I don't think this is getting into Bitcoin anytime soon, but the fact that they're doing this research now 
uh, is absolutely crucial. And, and the fact that this will probably get released on the liquid sidechain at some point is, uh, is even more important because uh, testing this sort of thing over years and in real use cases with real money, that, that is very, very important. Now, um, simplicity is, uh, you know, it, the, the name simplicity uh, suggests that it's fairly simple. Um, and it is in the sense that, uh, you know, there are only like nine primitives or something like that. And that those are the only things that you can do. But they're enough that you can create uh, more complex programs out of it. And, uh, but that, and that also makes it easier to prove that something is provably correct and so on. Um, uh, but you can, it turns out that using those uh, nine simple primitives, you can build um, extremely uh, complicated things like, uh, you know, checking like an ECDSA signature or a Schnorr signature or something like that. Um, and that's, that's what JETS is trying to do. It's, it, it, it's um, essentially using these primitives to build up useful um, checking things that, that you can have in simplicity uh, with JET. So instead of um, you know, having to build up an ECDSA verifier yourself, you can use JETS to, uh, to do that. So for a developer, this is perfect, right? Like you, can, uh, you, can, you don't have to write everything yourself. It's, uh, it's kind of like, um, like an open source library or something. And, um, and uh, apparently the performance is amazing and, uh, and you know, they're, uh, you know, it, it allows for sort of expansions that are really, really cool. Um, so, uh, among uh, the other claims that's in this article is that if Bitcoin had simplicity scripting today, the recent bit proposal for TAP and uh, Schnorr signatures could instead have been implemented as a smart contract without needing a soft fork. Ask at the new Lightning Network Design L2. And, um, and this is the nice thing about uh, having a more extensible, provable, um, clean uh, smart contract language like Simplicity. Um, it, it makes it possible to build these things um, and prove that it's actually secure. Um, unlike some uh, you know piece of crap like Solidity, which is absolutely not solid and it's uh, you know it, it has exploits all over the place because you know the the things that it's built on is uh, absolutely ridiculous. There's no way to prove anything. So. Um, and to men not to mention that it's Turing complete, so there are all sorts of Turing vulnerabilities as a result. So, um, yeah, th this is a, a really cool development that I, I think will uh, make the ecosystem better in the long run. So, I mean, we're 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 talking like ten year project here at least. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, good on them for doing it. Um, here's a demo of uh, of the actual simplicity stuff. Um, essentially, they fork Bitcoin and integrated simplicity into it as a, as a way to demo what simplicity could do. All right, uh, Calvin Kim has written an excellent overview of U-Tree-XO. So U-Tree-XO is really, really cool. Um, uh, so one of the things that everyone tells you is you need to run a full node. Um, you're master of your own node, but you're not master of anybody else's node. Um, and that, uh, but you know, having your own node gives you self sovereignty over your own money. Uh, you don't have to run software that other people tell you, which is what every hard fork does. Um, you instead get to uh, decide what software you run and the rules that it will enforce. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, running a full node can be pretty expensive. You you have to have a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of uh, storage and bandwidth and things like that. Um, uh, and more importantly, like CPU power and, and all that. Um, what UtreeXO does is it allows you to, uh, well, first of all, you can run in prune mode to get rid of the like 250 gigabyte uh, requirement and uh, bring that down to like 20 gigabytes or something like that. But the UtreeXO does even better. It's, it's literally like kilobytes of storage. Essentially, what you, what you do with UtreeXO is you store the UTXOs in a tree-like fashion. So you Merkleize all of the um, uh, UTXOs that exist and put it into a single hash, and that's what you store. Um, and you, uh, whenever um, you know there are new uh, transactions, what you do is what it has to come with a proof of that it was in the previous UTXO tree, and then you can prune it and so on. So. Um, it's, it's a really cool idea and it allows it, uh, uh, full nodes to 
essentially be runnable on like, uh, you know, hardware that doesn't have that much space, including something like your phone. Um, unfortunately, it does require more bandwidth, like 20% more. Uh, but I mean, a full node doesn't use that much bandwidth. Um, I, it does, but, you know, like uh, as bandwidth gets greater, this this will be a solution as well. So really cool article. Uh, thanks, Calvin, for writing that. Uh, Jameson Lop was pretty busy last week because uh, that wasn't the only one that he wrote. Um, this is the Bitcoin multi-sig time lock challenges. So I asked this question a while back. All I want is a multi-sig time lock wallet that works with existing hardware wallets. Is that too much to ask? Um, and essentially, how do you prevent $5 wrench attacks? Make funds impossible to move. And he goes through all of the reasons why Casa hasn't implemented time locks into their multi-sig products yet. Uh, most of it is that uh, they, they have certain security properties that they want, which is the, the rotation of keys whenever you want. If, if it's time lock, then you can't rotate keys out because you have a time lock. You can't, you, you can't uh, you know, unlock something until a certain period of time uh, passes. Um, there, there's also like, you know, some, uh, some of the uh, cost considerations. So uh, the scripts that gracefully degrade uh, multi-sig, for example, um, uh, cost a lot. It's a lot of opcodes and pub keys and so on. And, uh, and that makes it worse. Um, that said, uh, there is the fact that Taproot is coming and Taproot changes the equation considerably because all of those branches don't have to be revealed. And as a result, what you can do is you can have, um, uh, you know, you can just, uh, you know, combine them all and you don't have to pay that much. You, you, you only re pay for what you reveal, uh, which is only one branch at the most. So, um, it's a it's a lot better and uh, and you know it's an excellent article about the uh, you know just practical considerations around time locks which I, which will be very useful to you if you're uh, considering that in the future. All right, um, here is uh, Unchained Capital's um, uh, you know article on multi sig um, and how single keys are the foundation of a multi signature. And, uh, you know, they have this nice diagram on what a Bitcoin wallet does and really the multiple different functions that a Bitcoin wallet does. So um, there's uh, connecting to the consensus mechanism or the blockchain, as we, we would call it. Um, there's the coordinator. Um, if you're a multi-sig wallet, you have to collect signatures and, and combine them in a particular way and then, and then be able to uh, send it to the consensus mechanism to actually broadcast it. And then there's, of course, the key store, which is, uh, you know, a hardware wallet or something like that, where the actual private key lives. Oftentimes, uh, when we talk about a cold wallet, we're talking about like sort of cutting things off here, uh, making sure that the coordinator and consensus can be online, but the key store should be offline. So uh, when we talk about a Bitcoin wallet, it's it's really all of these things. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they, they go through the various, uh, you know, things about uh, multi-sig and why a single, sig single keys are sort of the building blocks of multi-sig. Um, yeah, it's an excellent article. I uh, encourage you to read it, to learn more about, um, you know, how multi-sig works and how to think about it in a way that makes sense. All right, uh, Lightning. All right, anonymous developer ZMNCP SCPXJ has written uh, this very informative post on griefing attacks. Essentially, uh, it's an attack on the Lightning network where um, you you pay for something, but uh, but you choose a route that's particularly long, and uh, and, and it, it delays the payment for a significant amount of time and. It's a, it's a way to sort of like lock up capacity for other nodes, for example, and it can be used in sort of malicious ways uh, to for profit for somebody. So um, what Z-Man has come up with is a way to mitigate this a attack with something called, uh, what was it, proof of proof of closure. And essentially what that involves is uh, having a second timeout other than the on-chain one uh, go with each payment and um, and essentially have, uh, you know, the, the end node have some sort of a commitment to not process that payment if, uh, if it comes after the soft timeout. So uh, as a way to sort of mitigate against this attack, if you know that after a certain amount of time you haven't heard from them, 
then you know at that point that uh, this payment's not going through, so you can kind of ignore it. So um, it's a really cool way to mitigate this sort of attack, and you can you can kind of tell it's it's a complicated attack, and uh, thinking through to how you can profit from it, and thinking adversarially and things like that, uh, it gives you a really good appreciation uh, for what developers, especially on the Lightning Network, have to do in order to figure out, okay, well, um, you know, can they exploit this in, in, in some way? Um, this is what security is all about. This is why it pays to be very, very paranoid about all of the p possible ways in which a system can be exploited. Um, so excellent article, and I encourage you to read it. And if you're especially interested in this sort of thing, uh, read the entire discussion because there, there's a lot of good stuff going on in there. Um, all right, so this is a website that I found out about, LN Market. So it's essentially it's a it's a CFD uh, or contract for difference platform. Now it's, it's completely centralized, but the idea is that you can uh, you can create a contract uh, that does um, that figures out uh, the difference between what you want to bet on and where the Bitcoin price is and and, and things like that. So. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I haven't heard of, uh, anything like this before, uh, but, uh, but the fact that the site exists is interesting. Um, uh, apparently you can do something similar with, uh, discrete log contracts on the lightning network. Um, I still think you have the Oracle problem and you can get kind of screwed out of something. Uh, but it is, it is an interesting idea. All right, economics, engineering, etc. All right, so Unchained Capital has also been busy, uh, but they they had this other article by Phil Geiger. Twenty one million is non negotiable. Um, excellent, excellent article about um, you know all of the different sort of fallacies that go into Bitcoin about the mining death spiral and transaction fee market and things like that. Um, and uh, I, 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 all right, so the electricity argument, for example. Assuming dollar of X value, X value of Bitcoin transaction fees will need to be at least Y to cover today's mining expenses without subsidy. So goes through a couple of three bad assumptions here. Assuming X value of Bitcoin transactions fees will need to be Y and using the current mining expenses to estimate the future. All of these things are constantly changing and that's kind of the point. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, yeah, w one of the things that it's point pointing out is Laszlo famously paid, uh, 10,000 BTC for two pizzas. He also paid one Bitcoin, uh, for that transaction, which is interesting because it was only worth, uh, you know, less than a penny at the time. And, uh, you know, and the, uh, the 10 years later, the, a full block had 0.28 BTC of fees. So it was much less in Bitcoin terms uh, than what Laszlo's uh, transaction had uh, in that block. So it, it's pretty interesting in that way. Um, all right. So, yeah, I, I mean, it, it talks about the Fed and all the money printing. It's, it's an excellent economics argument uh, for why Bitcoin will continue to succeed. Um, Coin Monks uh, has published an article about uh, Bitcoin, and uh, it, it's basically all of the memes that are in Bitcoin. Uh, stacking Sats, what's it about? Money Printer Go Burr, what's that about? OK Boomer, um, and 6.15, and HODL, and uh, orange number uh, go orange coin good number go up um, and all, all that it's a it's a nice overview of all of the sort of cultural things around Bitcoin Twitter that might be useful as well all right so factum has almost entered liquidation they're apparently down to two people um, it's basically Paul Snow and Jay Smith I talked a little bit about this on Tone Show, but essentially this was an ICO back in 2015. Uh, their white paper released in 2014. I wrote about um, all the uh, sort of insanities within that white paper. I think it was one of the first white papers that I read uh, from an ICO. And I was just like, this is ridiculous. You do not need a token. You can do all of these things with Bitcoin. Why, why do you need a token? And I was arguing with Paul about it uh, even back then. And, uh, and he came up with these like mental gymnastics and weird justifications why you needed a coin. And uh, I mean, it was pretty obvious to me that the reason why they did that was to raise money. Um, and uh, in fact, them sold a bunch of uh, tokens and Factum Incorporated, I guess, uh, raised a ton of money based on 
fact in the coin and they they raised something like 18 million dollars they burned through all of it apparently and uh and they're they're down to um uh, they're they're down to just two employees, um, and you know my argument for ICOs has been like, uh, but been that all of these foundations, all of these companies that are sort of built around it, all of these grants and whatever, um, what what ends up happening is that uh, the these companies become rent seekers, and uh, they're the zombie companies that that sort of exist as long as they can and try to make the most of the money that they have because they know there's no other revenue coming in. There's no actual product. Uh, the product was the token sale. And that um, and, you know, uh, this does not bode well for the 2017, 2018 class of ICOs um, that that was about two and a half years ago. Factum took about five years. I expect these to last at least that long. Uh, something like EOS is probably going to last another, you know, ten years because they they um, they raised a crap ton of money. So, uh, but you know, um, many of them probably have already gone under. But there there's a good number of them that will just simply run out of money and find no new investment. So, uh, it's uh, you know it, it's uh, you know I. I I think I've been proven right in my assessment of Factum from 2014. It's uh, it's still sad to see that uh, you know they managed to scam so many people and uh, lived on it for so long. All right, uh, Canaan, which is a public Bitcoin mining company, has released their uh, fourth uh, 2019 um, financial results. Uh, the the interesting numbers are the net loss, which was 149 million, uh, compared to revenues, which was 204 million, which is really not good at all. Um, but the really interesting thing is Q4, where they lost 114 million. So almost all of their, or like 70, 80 percent of their losses, came uh, in Q4. And while they only got like a third of the revenue, which was uh, 66 million. So um, that tells you like Q4 really, really hurt them. Um, uh, and uh, there's a bunch of things in here that are interesting. The, uh, you know, they talk about the cost of revenues, uh, research and development expenses in the fourth quarter were 9.1 million. So most of it was not research and development related. Sales and marketing expenses, 1.1 million. General and administrative expenses, 8.1 million. So, huh, very interesting, huh? Like they're spending 8 million on administration and 9 million on research. Re research is generally where you create, uh, create new designs for new miners and stuff like that. Uh, but most of that loss came from operations, which means that they took a bet and it didn't work out so uh pretty sad uh it looks like they've they, they've done kind of bad but uh you know it, it does give you uh some insight into how these things work and where the money goes and how they um how how uh, mining business sort of runs so very good article for learning all of that i would encourage you to look at it for that reason all right. Um, I did last week's show uh, was on you know um, LSAT uh, Nick Sabo shelling out. I did part two on Wednesday. I also did a show with Tone Vase on the BCH having. Uh, let's go to my Twitter feed and explain some of my tweets uh, with that this uh, part of show that I do that. Uh, by the way, if you're new here, please pound the like button and subscribe. All right, let's take a look at some of my tweets because uh, I did do a good number of those. Um, that was April 8th. That was showing out. All right, there we go. All right, LSAT paying for like, uh, yeah. All right, so funny how toilet paper manufacturers are only producing premium toilet paper in small packages. They're not dumb. They know this isn't going to last. Banks and big businesses are doing the same, just on a much bigger scale. Opt out with Bitcoin. So if you haven't noticed, most grocery stores have a lot of toilet paper now. Um, the frenzy is over. They've caught up with capacity. Uh, but the toilet paper manufacturers knew that this day was coming. Their, their products were in demand for a long time. Uh, but during that time, they really only manufactured their premium toilet paper that got had the most profit margin in the packages that would that were sufficiently large as to not um, 
have too much scrutiny, but allow for them to make a lot of money. And that's exactly what they did with uh, toilet paper. And banks and big businesses are kind of doing the same, right? Like they're taking advantage of the temporary demand for money as a way to make a lot of money themselves, uh, mostly through borrowing. Um, I remember thinking back in 2000 uh, that the big uh, big dig in Boston cost a lot uh, at $24 billion. That number seems so quaint now. This is what monetary expansion looks like and how your savings get destroyed. Uh, the big dig was supposed to cost like $2 billion, it, the, and the federal government paid for it. It turned out to uh, have a giant cost overrun to $24 billion. Um, at the time, um, when I heard that number, it was just kind of an insane number. Uh, nobody thought like twenty-four billion—that's way too much money. How 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 does anyone have that? Uh, you know, how could anything be that expensive, uh, especially a construction project? Of course, uh, now that we look back on it, it it seems so quaint in large part because monetary expansion just keeps going and you know we uh, were um, inured to large numbers like that especially after 2008 and especially after like the last month uh, you know six trillion doesn't uh, like six trillion is sort of like the new normal in terms of like bailouts and stuff so um, you know it, we're gonna reach in the quadrillions eventually so that's that's what's going on Bitcoin is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. Altcoins are 1% desperation, 99% devastation. Blockchains are 1% solicitation, 99% exaggeration. So um, Bitcoin, um, uh, you know, you'll, you'll hear about it and you may feel inspired. But most of the time you're just holding, which is perspiration. Altcoins, uh, you get into it normally as a result of feeling like you fix, uh, missed out on Bitcoin, which is the desperation part. And, but most of the time, you're just um, you know suffering even more because your altcoin goes down against Bitcoin. Uh, blockchains are one percent solicitation. It's based on some sort of need in the market for some solution for uh, something that is very very difficult to solve. But it's ninety nine percent exaggeration. It doesn't solve it at all. It's just um, it's all smoke and mirrors. All right, uh, TLDR, Airbnb had a 50% down round and will pay $100 million a year for the pet privilege. Listen, that is the sound of VC sweating. They pour billions into overpriced pre-IPO Silicon Valley companies. How much better would they have done if they just put that money into Bitcoin? Shaking my head. All right, so Airbnb uh, took a down round, essentially, um, and... Uh, they got a loan for about a billion dollars at 10 percent uh interest rate um and the thing about it is that they they had to give up um uh give up some uh equity uh in the form of warrants to those um taking uh, taking a position so uh th those loaning it to them so essentially this debt becomes equity if they do well this debt is uh, payable if they don't. So it's kind of a lose-lose situation, but that's that that's the situation that a lot of these companies are finding themselves in. And the question that I, I think uh, every VC needs to think about is, uh, well, are, these valuations aren't going to keep going up, and that means our internal rate of return is going to look terrible. Um, isn't putting money into Bitcoin a lot better? So that's that's where we are. All right, uh, BCH Network will need another 144 pretty slow blocks for the difficulty to adjust. That's a lot of potential revenue that the miners mining Bitcoin will have to give up. Rough calc, 144K of lost revenue in order to keep BCH going. Um, I think it was largely um, Antpool and uh, Bitcoin.com that paid that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they, they could have made more money mining other stuff, but they didn't. So they paid that an opportunity cost. Uh, a lot of those, uh, I mean, they, they have now like 0.4% of the hash rate. Um, it is very easy to attack, but as you'll see in another tweet, I, don't, I, I think that would be a mistake to attack them. Wells Fargo, one of the worst actors of the 2008 crisis, is, giving, is being given a much longer leash by the Federal Reserve. They get to abuse the system in more interesting ways because they're distributors of the newly printed money. Bitcoin lets us opt out. So the, uh, something that a lot of people don't get about why uh, banks uh, you know, continue to exist is that they're, they're essentially... Um, you know, expansions of the uh, of the Federal Reserve. They're arms of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve prints money, but 
you, it never goes to consumers directly. It goes to other banks. Uh, they're the banks, bank for banks. Uh, they're the central bank. So every bank has an account, uh, at least denominated in USD. Uh, every bank has an account with the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve is, uh, you know, keeps their accounts and stuff like that. So those uh, to really get the money out into the public, they have to use these in intermediaries, these banks, and that's how corrupt the system is. And uh, you know, uh, Wells Fargo essentially abuse that privilege in 2008 uh, as a way to you know get more and more money they created a bunch of fake accounts so they can get access to even more money than they already had so um, uh, so the Federal Reserve, I think, put some sanctions on them as a result of that I mean the public outcry was just absolutely nuts after that so um, uh, they put some restrictions they lifted a lot of them this time again I mean what could go wrong, right? Somebody that abused their privilege last time, you're giving them those same privileges again to uh, hand out more small business loans and so on. So um, that's that's kind of what's happening, and that's what I wanted to uh, point out in that tweet. Um, this is uh, Tech with Catalina. I, I did a show with her a while back. Um, she finally published it. It's about transactions. Um, should be pretty good. Uh, at what point is the cure worse than the disease? When would you know? We've passed that point. We've flushed the economy down the toilet and the state has exercised powers that the USSR wouldn't have dreamed of. When does liberty outweigh safety? Now, the USSR did not have digital tracking. They did not have uh, you know cameras everywhere and things like that. So they couldn't enforce things despite their will to do so probably higher than the will of the authorities that we currently have. But... Are the the authorities that are currently in power have a lot access to a lot more resources uh, that that could take away our civil liberties. So, in a sense, like we're in a lot more danger as a result of having, uh, you know, the authorities having so much power or so much access to tech. So you have to ask yourself, uh, you know, when is the cure worse than the disease? The disease? I, I, I'm certain that the authorities could, for example, enforce, um, you know, a quarantine for months and not let you out of the house and only, um, you know, deliver uh, food to you like uh, in packages or something like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, th this is a, this a legitimate question. When, when is it enough? All right, uh, this is the M2 money supply chart from January uh, 1st, 2020 to March 23rd. Um, I, I did an update because uh, it turned out that the next day they um, uh, updated it again. But it was like 6.2% over the first 83 days of the year. Uh, that's how much money expanded, which is crazy because, uh, of course, like inflation always comes in at around 1%. Um, it's, uh, that's, that's based on CPI. Monetary expansion itself is like 6.2% uh, in 83 days. And uh, as you'll see later, it was more like 8.3% over the first three months, which is in of itself really crazy. Maturity is not being happy all the time or seeing the bright side always. Maturity is being able to handle uh, situations appropriately. Scams deserve scorn. Goodness deserves praise. Immaturity is the inability or refusal to tell the difference. This was subtweeting what Vitalik said, gr grumpy people don't respect grumpy people or something like that and talking about maturity. Really, it's it's a ridiculous statement. Um, you should be grumpy when grumpiness is uh, appropriate for that particular thing. Uh, if you're grumpy all the time, yeah, maybe I agree. But if you're grumpy about a particular thing, if it deserves grumpiness, then that's per perfectly mature. Um, to be grumpy all the time, maybe not. But being happy all the time is just as immature. It's uh, if you're happy about the fact that somebody in your family died, then that's not very mature. That's uh, that's that's not. Uh, in fact, that that would be like just uh, kind of cruel. Um, but. You know, having the right emotion for the right event uh, or right circumstance is part is maturity, and that that's what he was missing. That's what I was trying to subtweet. All this money printing will hurt the people in third world countries the most. USD demand in those countries will increase. Their currencies will hyperinflate, and our bureaucrats will wag their fingers at them for their bad monetary policy, which was forced on them. And this is. Um, 
this is the uh, something that a lot of people don't seem to realize is that uh, with the United States printing the money that it does, it actually tends to go much more towards third world countries. And a large part of it is because they took on a lot of debt while the dollar was fairly weak compared to their currency. Um, now that the dollar is getting stronger or there's a liquidity crunch which causes the dollar to get stronger, all, all of those dollar denominated debts need to be paid off. And in order to do that, uh, they need to go get dollars in order to do that. So uh, U.S. dollar demand shoots up in all of these countries. Uh, all, all of these third world countries and their currency is not that liquid. So what ends up happening is that the dollar goes up and uh, they, they experience inflation. Um, and in order to keep up, they, they have to expand their monetary supply. Um, and that in turn causes their prices to go up, whereas, whereas from a trade perspective, our prices don't. So um, we're ex essentially exporting inflation. And that's a really, really sad thing. TLDR, Fed is buying corporate bonds rated BBB minus. Fed will fund the Treasury up to $750 billion to create an SPV or a special purpose vehicle to buy bonds no one wants. If corporation defaults, Fed takes a loss. Banks can now dump garbage to the Fed. Banks and corps win. We get inflation. So Fed and Treasury cooperated to set up a special purpose vehicle to buy corporate bonds. And the reason why they're buying bonds that are triple B minus rated or higher is because they don't want those ratings to get lower. Um, one of the, uh, one of the co uh, comments from that tweet uh, or one of the replies to that tweet uh, pointed out that pension funds, if it goes below a triple B minus rating, what they have to do is sell those bonds. They can't keep them on their balance sheet. So uh, what, what the pension funds, uh, to prevent the pension funds from selling those things, um, and uh, the rating goes down if, uh, if uh, yield uh, gets to be too high or something like that. So the Fed is buying these as a way to prevent uh, a sort of a collapse of these corporate bonds. Now, these corporate bonds kind of deserve to go down in value because there's a liquidity crunch um, and the interest rate should go up in, uh, in proportion and the pension should sell them. But, you know, there's no liquidity in these. Uh, they're they're, they're going to get pennies on them and a lot of these pension funds will end up losing a lot of money. Now, they... They've been trying to do better with their money, but they they haven't been able to keep up the seven or eight percent uh, returns that they've been promising to their pensioners. So, uh, as a way to protect that, this is what the Fed is doing, and it's um, it's only just prolonging the inevitable, which is that these uh, a lot of these bonds and funds are going to collapse, and you're just keeping the scam going longer. All right, so the Fed did um, publish uh, an additional data point, uh, which made it even worse. Uh, so year to date, M2 monetary expansion has been 8.58%, uh, which is over uh, $1.3 trillion. So that's, uh, so monetary supply, uh, M2 money supply was 15.35 trillion in January. Uh, March 30th, it was 16.67 trillion, which is, Insane, because that that's uh you know eight percent more M two money than existed just three months ago. So, I mean, uh, if you uh, just in the week of March twenty third, that was a two point two eight percent increase, and annualized, that ends up being like two hundred twenty four percent. That's like hyperinflation territory, guys. Um, that that's uh, that's what I mean. Obviously, they're not going to do that forever, but I expect the first week of April and the second week of April to be probably around that like level. So, I mean, we're going to see easily like 15% this year. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we're going into like 30, 40% for the year because they, they have a lot more money to be handing out and, uh, spending, uh, through all of these programs. Um, in contrast, Bitcoin is going to be less than 2% after the next halving, which is pretty crazy. Uh, insurance works until it doesn't. Savings is the most honest path that one, uh, than one fraught with misaligned incentives. Bitcoin is better. So um, insurance is one way to sort of hedge against downside, except 
it doesn't really protect you from catastrophic downside. So for example, if everybody suffers the loss at once, the insurance company will get bankrupt and you won't get anything. Um, and that, that's kind of what you want to hedge against. Those are the, uh, are the scenarios when, you know, that, that you want to make sure that you're protected against and insurance just doesn't work for those. Um, thing about Bitcoin is even in those cases, Bitcoin, is Bitcoin. One Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. And that's, um, and in, in a time of scarcity, um, you know, th this is your hedge against the U S dollar collapse. Um, and in the case of a U.S. dollar collapse, and even if you get paid out in insurance, you're getting paid out in dollars. So it's probably not going to do you very good. And if they're paying out in something else, then they might collapse period. So it's, uh, it's very, uh, important to understand that Bitcoin is, uh, an excellent hedge and that uh, on stuff that insurance doesn't cover. Uh, Nicola, Nicola Resme was a French bishop from the 14th century. His great insul, insight was that mon money belonged to the community and that any alteration should require the consent of the community. Bitcoin is the first money to realize this ideal. Um, excellent theologian and also economist. Uh, so he basically took all of the economic thoughts of Aquinas and the scholastics and compiled them into a uh, into a single volume, which is, uh, which was very, very useful for anyone trying to track the history of economic thought. But this was an excellent insight. Uh, money does belong to the community and belongs to everyone that owns it. And they're the ones that ma should make the decision, not some centralized authority. So, um, you know, for example, Ethereum, Monero, all of these other altcoins, uh, essentially are in the fiat model of a centralized governance. Uh, consent of the entire community, on the other hand, with Bitcoin, uh, that's what you're allowed, uh, you're, you can do by running your own node. And that's, uh, that's what makes Bitcoin special. And that's, uh, it uniquely satisfies this particular condition. The incompetence of government officials and central planning in general is on full display. Remember this next time someone proposes we should have the government do X or Y. So a lot of governments are banning like sales of uh, random stuff like candy or soil or seeds and, and things like that, which is completely incompetent. There's no reason why the same, if a store is open, why you shouldn't allow them to sell other stuff. Uh, but that's, uh, that's what they're doing because they're completely incompetent. So, um, enforcing almost anything as a government uh, tends to be fraught with a lot of inefficiency and a lot of uh, broken eggs, if you will. So um, that's what I'm pointing out. I've heard it suggested many times that a low hash rate altcoin should be attacked to kill it off. This is a mistake. First, it's not clear an attack kills off the coin. Second, a survived attack probably makes it stronger. Third, you've now justified nasty attacks against you. So, um, so first one is, uh, you know, an attack might not kill off the coin, right? Like, uh, I, like killing it off means like getting the price down to zero. In fact, it's almost certain that it wouldn't. Um, and if there is a, a reaction that, uh, steals them against this particular attack, now you've just made it stronger. Uh, and that, that's not a very good thing. And third, you've justified nasty attacks against you. And by you, I don't mean, uh, you know, whatever coin you represent. I mean, you personally, if you went out and did like, if you got a group of your friends to uh, rent enough hash rate to attack BCH or BSV or whatever, um, okay, what's going to happen? Well, your attack fails. Now, what do you think the BCH and BSV trolls are going to do? Right. I mean, like, uh, they, they, uh, some of them, like, uh, somebody like called Jameson Lop's house, uh, to get it swatted, uh, because they didn't like what he said. What do you think they're going to do to you? Right. Like, I, I mean, uh, like you're putting yourself in some serious danger by doing that. I mean, there, there may be fanatics that, that, that are crazy enough to go and get a gun and try to shoot you like that. That's the level of attack that you are inviting by attacking their coin. So, um, this is why I think it's a serious mistake and I, I, I think you should just live and let, let live, let it die on its own slowly due to their own, um, you know, shots in the foot to themselves instead of trying to put a bullet through their head. Most likely you're going to miss and, uh, and you're just going to make them live longer. All right. Uh, <laughs> It's interesting that Vitalik had this tweet a little later. The fact that you replied that way speaks volumes about just how self-styled cypherpunks, really maximalists, have fallen over the last decade. No interest in technology, just literal dreams about number go up. 
Um, yeah, this is a guy that uh, tweeted about being grumpy uh, and not respecting people. Well, if we apply that same standard to you, buddy, you are grumpy and you should be uh, not respected. All right, the first movers after the quarantine will have an advantage economically given the pent-up demand. The businesses that offer it are first first are going to get a bigger portion of the pie. Now, this is not to say that there, are, uh, there aren't going to be people that are not uh you know that are going to self quarantine longer uh but the people that do go out they're going to want goods and services the reason that they go out in the first place is to consume goods and services that they might not otherwise have had access to so um there's a pent up demand right like i i would love to go rock climbing right now but none of the rock climbing gyms are open uh, i i've tried to rock climb outdoors but you know it's um it's it's tricky it's a little more dangerous i i really need to go take a lead climbing class or something like that um to to and get the equipment to be able to do that for next time uh but yeah you know, i want to climb in a gym in a safe environment and uh and none of none of them offer it but so first one that opens up i am going i'm probably gonna go for like three days until i get sick of it because that's what i want to do and there's a lot of pent up demand like that right like you might want to go get a massage or go to a restaurant or um you know go to a bar and have a drink with your friend or uh, go to a coffee shop and like sit there for a few hours right like stuff like that stuff stuff like that is very important to humans which is why these businesses make money in the first place the first people to open will have that sort of first mover advantage uh over uh, you know businesses that take an extra two weeks to open um and that that's what i'm pointing out in this tweet so you know um, you know, regardless of whether or not there are people that self quarantine longer, the people that do come out, they're, they're going to want to want some services. All right. Uh, the two questions I asked on Sunday were, uh, say your jurisdiction allowed for all businesses to open tomorrow. How much longer would you voluntarily quarantine yourself? Looks like most people, uh, would do zero days, some for a couple of weeks, uh, you know, some for like two months. Uh, some longer than that. The 61 plus is kind of crazy to me, but apparently that's uh, what some people are willing to do. Uh, follow up was, say you were the top authority in your jurisdiction, how much longer would you keep the quarantine stay in place orders going? Um, uh, less people said zero. <laughs> so the difference in numbers, it, it almost seem, always seems like less. Uh, seems like, uh, you know, uh, for me, but not for the kind of attitude. Uh, for at least a small portion of uh, the poll takers. Um, most funds compete against depreciating ever expanding dollar. Bitcoin will make that business much tougher in the long run. And this is true um, because, uh, you know, funds uh, take 2 and 20, uh, which means that they take a 2% management fee every year and 20% of what are per profits. But those profits are pegged to the dollar. Once they get pegged to Bitcoin, which is what uh, LPs are going to demand as uh, once Bitcoin becomes much more of a store of value, um, what are they going to do? I mean, they have to compete against Bitcoin. They have to find some seriously good deals in order to get an internal rate of return that justifies a 20% cut. So, um, you know, that that's, uh, that's something to uh, think about for all these funds. The reason why so many funds exist is because they're competing against the dollar. It's, relatively easy to do that because you just put it in stocks you're going to get six seven percent um and that that's almost guaranteed uh and if you're going to go higher than that then you know you have to do a little more work but it's uh it's been there for a while if the government can pr just print money why do we pay taxes at all because it keeps up the illusion that monetary expansion is not a tax Instead, such actions become monetary policy or adding liquidity to the system to deceive us. Bitcoin is the monetary res red pill. So the whole, uh, you know, why do we pay taxes at all? They can print all the money they want. Um, but the reason why we keep paying taxes is to deceive us into thinking that the monetary expansion is it like comes from somewhere else, that it isn't a tax. Um, and you can see it in the way people sort of talk about, uh, you know, the checks that they're going to get for $1,200 or whatever. Um, they don't seem to realize it's actually coming out of your own pocket, uh, out of your own savings. You just don't realize it yet. You're, you're just getting sort of like a payday loan uh, and you'll, you'll pay for it down the line. Um, and that, that's, uh, that's the essence of what, what's going on. But in order to keep up the charade, 
um, they have to tax us and uh, and take money away that way. Um, and as a result, we we think we're in the system where we're paying in and the government spends money and so on. Um, but really, the whole system is to is set up so that you don't realize that you're a slave, right? Like just like the Matrix. Um, you know what is the truth? It's that you are a slave um, and that. You've been deceived all your life, and you know really uh, there's no way to explain what this is. But you know if you take this red pill, you'll learn, um, and that's what the Bitcoin, what Bitcoin has been for a lot of people, including myself. Um, all right, uh, people will touch again. It's absurd to think otherwise. Nearly all forms of social bonding require it. To think everyone would give that up permanently is ludicrous. Many people fear now, but fear doesn't last forever. Um, a lot of people have a tendency to project their emotional state into the future in a linear fashion. So they, they're like, okay, well, I feel fearful right now. Um, so therefore I will feel, feel fearful, you know, 12 months from now, uh, you know, in the same way. Um, that's, uh, generally a very bad projection, uh, especially linearly. There might be some remnant of that left over, but generally like it's not going to last that long. Uh, I, I mean, maybe I, I give it six months at the most, uh, um, you know, of people fearing certain things, especially, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, it becomes more normal to do otherwise, like shake hands or hug or whatever. Uh, like touching is such a par big part of the human experience of human life. Uh, any social bonding almost requires it. So, uh, it's crazy to me to think that this will just be kind of go away. Uh, there are people saying, Oh, no one's going to shake hands again. I, I really highly, highly, highly doubt that. And if anyone wants to make a bet on that, uh, that a year from now that, uh, that we won't see like leaders like shaking hands on TV or something like that, I'll take that bet. I'll take that bet because I, I really don't think it's going away. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's social custom, uh, changing that stuff. I, um, yeah, I, I, I just don't think it's going to happen. All right. Uh, all right. So Pally wrote this uh, particular tweet. Anyone who calls themselves a software engineer should be required to be licensed, have a graduate degree in engineering, and carry at least $1 million in professional liability insurance. And certain types of software should only be sold if approved by a software engineer. So basically, he's suggesting that engineering, uh, software engineering should be like some other engineering disciplines that are highly regulated and have professional licensing um, uh, you know, groups and, uh, tests and, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, insurance requirements and things like that. Um, I completely, completely disagree because this would take the cost of software to astronomical levels. Uh, if you want a software developer to sign off on something as having no bugs or something like that, which is essentially what this guy wants. Uh, well, then you're going to have to pay a lot of money for it. I mean, I'm talking tens of years, billions of dollars to prove all of that stuff. Um, and it, it ain't going to come cheap and it ain't going to come easy. Um, and most software, if you, if you know about the software industry, it's a, it's like one-off things that are very small and, uh, you know, like doing something for the back office or keeping track of something or other. Um, it's, it's not all Facebooks or Googles or, and things like that. It's, it, it's mostly back office software that you're writing. Um, those things are, uh, are not going to, you know, be built if, if you have this kind of regulation, if you need a graduate degree to be a software engineer, no one's going to be a software engineer. Um, and it, it would be hard to regulate it that way anyway. So, I mean, it, what what he says on his uh, on its face is ridiculous. It's uh, it, it it would just put a clamp on any sort of software in innovation, and um, you know it would kind of make it like fiat money, like just no innovation for a very long time. So um, yeah, I think he's wrong in uh, in so many ways. Anyway, all right. So that was those were my tweets. Let's uh, let's go to the long read. Uh, Bitcoin and the rise of the cypherpunks. This is from Jameson Lop. While many of the innovations in the space are new, they're built on decades of work that led to this point. By tracing this history, we can understand the motivations behind the movement that spawned Bitcoin and share its vision for the future. And uh, I, I, I love this article. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go through it. From Bitcoin to blockchain to distributed ledgers, the cryptocurrency space is fast evolving to the point where it can be difficult to see in which direction it's headed. 
but we're not without clues. While many of the innovations in this space are new, they're built on decades of work that led to this point. By tracing this history, we can understand the motivations behind the movement that spawned Bitcoin and share its vision for the future. Before the 70s, cryptography was primarily practiced in secret by military or spy agencies. But that changed when two publications brought it to the open. The U.S. government publication of the data encryption standard and the first publicly available work on public key cryptography. New Directions in Cryptography by Dr. Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman. Uh, Diffie Hellman, of course. In the 1980s, uh, Dr. David Chom wrote extensively on topics such as anonymous digital cash and pseudonymous reputation systems, which he described in his paper, Security Without Identification, Transaction Systems to Make Big Brother Obsolete. Over the next several years, these ideas coalesced into a movement. In late 1992, Eric Hughes, Timothy C. May, and John Gilmore founded a small group that met monthly at Gilmore's company, Cygnus Solutions, in the San Francisco Bay Area. The group was humorously termed cypherpunks as a der derivation of cypher and cyberpunk. So cypher is, uh, is, a, is a way to encrypt and decrypt things in cryptography. Basically, it's, um, it's, a, it's a tool. So cypher and cyber, cypherpunk. Uh, the cypherpunks mailing list was uh, formed at about the same time. And just a few months later, Eric Hughes published a cypherpunks manifesto. He wrote, Privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. Privacy is not secrecy. A private matter is something one doesn't want the whole world to know. But a secret matter is something one doesn't want anybody to know. Privacy is the power to selectively reveal oneself to the world. That's all good and well, you may be thinking, but I'm not a cypherpunk. I'm not doing anything wrong. I have nothing to hide. As Bruce, Bruce Schneier said, the nothing to hide argument stems from the from a faulty premise that privacy about hiding a wrong. Uh, privacy is about hiding a wrong. For example, you likely have curtains over your window so that people can't see into your home. This isn't because you are undertaking illegal or immoral activities, but simply because you don't wish to worry about the potential cost of revealing yourself to the outside world. If you're reading this, you have directly benefited from the efforts of cypherpunks. Some notable cypherpunks and their achievements. Jacob Applebaum, Tor developer. Julian Assange, Assange, uh, Assange I think, um, founder of WikiLeaks. Dr. Adam Back, inventor of Hashcash, co-founder of Blockstream. Bram Cohen, creator of BitTorrent. Hal Finney, author, uh, main author of PGP 2.0, creator of reusable proof of work. Tim Hudson, co-author of SSLEAY, uh, the precursor to Open SSL. Paul Kosher, co-author of SSL 3.0. Moxie Marlinspike, co-founder of Open Whisper System, developer of Signal. Steven Shear, uh, the creator of the concept Warren Canary. Bruce Schneier, well-known security author, Zuko Wilcox O'Hearn, Digicash developer, founder of Zcash, Philip Zimmerman, creator of PGP 1.0. The 90s. This decade saw the rise of the crypto wars in which the U.S. government attempted to stifle the spread of strong commercial encryption. Since the market for cryptography was almost entirely military up to this point, encryption technology was included as a Category 13 item into the U.S. munitions list, which had strict regulations preventing its export. This limited export compatible SSL key lengths to 40 bits, which could be met, broken in a matter uh, of days using a single personal computer. Legal challenges by civil libertarians and piracy advocates, the widespread availability of encryption software outside the US and a successful attack by Matt Blaze against the government's proposed backdoor, the chipper, uh, clipper chip, led the government to back down. Uh, yeah, uh, in 1997, Dr. Adam Back created Hashcash, which was designed as an anti-spam mechanism that would essentially add a time and computational cost to sending email, thus making spam uneconomical. He envisioned that Hashcash would be easier for people to use Chom's Digicash since there was no need for creating the creation of an account. Hashcash even had some protection against double spending. Later, in 1998, Wei Dai published a proposal for B-Money, a practical way to enforce contractual agreements between anonymous actors. He described two interesting concepts that should sound familiar. First, a protocol in which every participant maintains a separate database of how much belongs to each user. Secondly, a variant of the first system where the accounts of who has what 
who has how much money are kept by a subset of the participants who are incentivized to remain honest by putting their money on the line. Uh, Bitcoin uses the former concept, while a few other cryptocurrencies have implemented a variant of the latter concept, which we now call proof of stake. So essentially, uh, Adam Back came up with the concept of proof of work uh, in Hashcash, Cash, and Wei Dai came up with the idea that everyone could hold uh, the, a copy of the ledger themselves. The 2000s. It's clear the cypherpunks had already been building on each other's work for, the, for decades, experimenting and layering laying the frameworks we needed in the 1990s, but a pivotal point was the creation of cypherpunk money in the 2000s. In 2004, Halfpenny created a reusable proof of work, which built on Adam Back's uh, hash cache. Re RPOWs were unique cryptographic tokens that can only be used once, much like unspent transaction outputs in Bitcoin. However, validation and protection against double spending was still performed by a central server. Nick Sabo published a paper for Bitgold in 2005, a digital collectible that built on Halfpenny's RPOW proposal. However, Sabo did not propose a mechanism for limiting the total units of Bitgold, but rather envisioned that units would be valued differently based on the amount of computational work performed to create them. So the idea is uh, you perform a certain amount of proof of work, and depending on the proof of work that was performed, that's, uh, that's how much the, uh, the thing was worth. And you put it into a central database, and that could that could work. Finally, in 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto, a pseudonym for a still unidentified individual or individuals, published the Bitcoin white paper citing both Hashcash and B-Money. In fact, Satoshi emailed Wei Dao directly and mentioned that he learned about B-Money from Dr. Back. Satoshi dedicated a section of the Bitcoin white paper to privacy, which reads, the traditional banking model achieves a level of privacy by limiting access to information to the parties involved and the trusted third party. The necessity to announce all transactions publicly precludes this method, but privacy can still be maintained by breaking the flow of information in another place by keeping public keys anonymous. The public can see that someone is sending an amount to someone else, but without information linking the transaction to anyone. This is similar to the level of information released by stock exchanges where the time and size of individual trades, the tape is made public, but without telling who the parties were. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto triggered an avalanche of progress with a working system that people could use, extend, and fork. Bitcoin strengthened the entire cypherpunk movement by enabling organizations such as WikiLeaks to continue operating via Bitcoin donations, even after the traditional finance system, financial system had cut them off. The struggle for privacy. However, as the Bitcoin ecosystem has grown over the past few years, privacy concerns seem to have pushed to the back, been pushed to the back burner. Many early Bitcoin users assumed that the system would give them complete anonymity, but we have learned otherwise as various law enforcement agencies have revealed that they are able to de-anonymize Bitcoin users during investigations. The Open Bitcoin Privacy Project has picked up some of the slack with regard to educating users about privacy and recommending best practices for Bitcoin services. The group is developing a threat model for attacks on Bitcoin wallet privacy. Their model currently breaks attackers into several categories. Blockchain observers link different transactions together to the same identity by observing patterns in the flow of value. Network observers link different transactions and addresses together by observing activity on the peer-to-peer -peer network. So one's the blockchain, one's uh, on the actual peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, physical adversaries try to find data on a wallet device in order to tamper with it or perform analysis on it. Uh, so like lit literally go to a physical device. Uh, transaction participants uh, create transactions that aid them in tracing and de-anonymizing activity on the blockchain. Wallet providers may pro require personally identifiable information from users and then observe their transactions. Um, Jonas Nick at Blockstream has also done a fair amount of research regarding privacy concerns for Bitcoin users. He has an excellent presentation in which he uncovers a number of privacy flaws, some of which are devastating to SPV Bitcoin clients. One of the greatest privacy issues in Bitcoin is from blockchain observers because every transaction on the network is indefinitely public. Anyone in the present and future can be a potential adversary. As a result, one of the oldest recommended best practices is to never reuse a, a Bitcoin address. Satoshi even made a note of it in the Bitcoin white paper. As an additional firewall, new key pairs should be used for each transaction to keep them from being linked to a common owner. Some linking is still unavoidable with multi-input transactions, which necessarily reveal their inputs were owned by the same owner. The risk is that if the owner of a key is revealed, linking could reveal transactions that belong to the same owner. And this is 
essentially how chain, al chain analysis works is that if they're spent together, they're assumed to be the same person. And that's what CoinJoin sort of uh, defeats. Uh, recent cypherpunk innovations. A multitude of systems and best practices have been developed in order to increase the privacy of Bitcoin users. Dr. Peter Woolley authored Bit32 Hierarchical Deterministic Wallets, which makes it simpler for Bitcoin wallets to manage addresses. While privacy was not Woolley's uh, primary motivation, HD wallets make it easier to avoid address reuse because the tech can easily generate new addresses as transactions flow into and out of the wallet. Elliptic curve Diffie Hellman Merkle uh, addresses are Bitcoin address schemes that increase privacy. EC ED ECDHM addresses can be shared publicly and are used by senders and receivers to uh, secretly derived traditional Bitcoin addresses that the that blockchain observers cannot predict. The result is that ECDHM addresses can be reused without loss of privacy that usually occurs from traditional Bitcoin address reuse. Some examples of ECDHM address schemes used include um, stealth addresses by Peter Todd, BIP47 reusable payment codes by Justice Van Veer, and BIP75 out of band address exchange by Justin Newton and others. Um, and this this is uh, the Diffie Hellman exchange. Um, I, I, he, he should probably include the idea of easy peasy because that also uses a, a, a similar scheme. Bitcoin mixing is a more labor intensive method by which users can increase their privacy. The concept of mixing coins with, an, uh, with other participants is similar to the concept of mix networks invented by Dr. Chom. Several different mixing algorithms have been developed. CoinJoin, blockchain co-founder Gregory Maxwell's original proposal for mixing coins uh, CoinJoin essentially lets users create a transaction with, with many inputs from the multiple people and then send the coins to many other outputs that pay back to the same people, thus mixing the values together and making it difficult to tell which inputs are with, related to which outputs. Join Market, developed by developer, uh, built by developer Chris Belcher, Join Market enables holders of Bitcoin to allow their coins to be mixed via CoinJoin with other users' coins in return for a fee. It uses a kind of smart contract so that your private keys never leave your computer, thus reducing the risk of loss. Put simply, Join Market allows you to improve the privacy of Bitcoin transactions for low fees in a decentralized fashion. Coin Shuffle, a decentralized mixing protocol developed by a group of researchers at Saarland University in Germany. Coin Shuffle improves applying coin join. It does not require a trusted third party to assemble the mixing transactions and thus not does not require uh, additional mixing fees. CoinSwap, another concept developed by Maxwell. CoinSwap is substantially different from CoinJoin in that it uses a series of four multi-sig transactions, two escrow payments, two escrow releases, to trustlessly swap coins between two parties. It is less efficient than CoinJoin, but can potentially offer greater privacy even in facilitating the swapping of coins between two different um, blockchain so you can go to another chain and then come back or something like that while mixing is tantamount to hiding in a crowd often the crowd is not particularly large mixing should be considered as providing obfuscation rather than complete anonymity because it makes it difficult for casual observers to tra trace the flow of funds but more sophisticated observers may still be able to de-obfuscate the mixing transactions what he's talking about here are anonymity sets that is how big a uh, set are you hiding in how big of a crowd are you hiding in Christoph Atlas, founder of OBPP, posted his foundings on weaknesses and uh, improperly implemented coin join clients back in 2014. So if you know that these are going to this, then you can figure out these are going to this and so on. Atlas noted that even with a fairly primitive analysis tool, he was able to group 69% of inputs and 53% of a co single coin join transactions outputs. There are even separate cryptocurrencies that have been developed with privacy in mind. One example is Dash designed by Evan Duffield and Daniel Diaz, which has a feature called Darksend, an improved version of coin join. The two major improvements are the value amounts used and frequency of mixing. Dash's mixing uses common denominations of 0 0.1, 1, 10, and 100 in order to make groupings of inputs and outputs much more difficult. In, mix in each mixing session, users submit the same denomination as inputs and outputs. To maximize the privacy offered by mixing and make timing attacks more difficult, dark uh, send runs automatically at send in the intervals which also, of course, increases their blockchain really, really fast. <laughs> Another, and uh, this is why they need master nodes and proof of stake and all this other stuff, and um, that in turn makes it a, a shitcoin. Another privacy-focused crypt cryptocurrency is not even based on Bitcoin. The Crypto Node white paper was released in 2014 by Nicholas Van Saberhagen, and the concept has been 
implemented in several cryptocurrencies such as Monero. The primary innovations are cryptographic ring signatures and unique one-time keys. Regular di digital signatures such as those used in Bitcoin involve a single pair of keys, one public and one private. This allows the owner of a public address to prove that they own it by signing a, uh, signing a spend of funds with the corresponding private key. Ring signatures were first proposed in 2001 by Dari Dr. Ari Shamir and others building upon the group of Signature scheme uh, upon the group signature scheme was that was introduced in 1991 by Dr. Chum and Eugene Van Heist. Ring signatures involved a group of individuals, each with their own private and public key. The statement proved by a ring signature is that the signer of a given message is a member of the group. The main distinction with the ordinary uh, digital signature schemes is that the signer needs a single secret key, but a verifier cannot establish the exact identity of the signer. Therefore, if you encounter a rich signature with the public keys of Alice, Bob, and Carol, you can only claim that one of these individuals was the signer, but you will not be able to know exactly to whom the transaction belongs. It provides another level of obfuscation that makes it more difficult for blockchain observers to track the ownership of payments as they flow through the system. So in, in other words, ring signature is, uh, they, they have an anonymity set uh, based on the number of ring signers um, or ring public key, sorry. Uh, interestingly enough, ring signatures were developed specifically in the context, context of whistleblowing as they enable the anonymous leaking of secrets while still proving that the source of the secrets is reputable, an individual who is part of a known group. CryptoNode is also designed to mitigate risks associated with key reuse and input-to-output tracing. Every address for a payment is unique one-time key derived from both the sender's and recipient's data. As soon as you use a ring signature in your input, it adds more uncertainty as to which output has, been, has just been spent. This also is a problem for Monero because their blockchain grows indefinitely. You can't ever prune anything because uh, there, uh, you know, there is no UTXO set. They're all UTXOs because you have, you have no idea if they've been spent or not. If a blockchain observer tries to draw a graph with used addresses, uh, connecting them via the transactions on the blockchain, it will be a tree because no address was used twice. The number of gra possible graphs rises exponentially as you add more transactions to the graph since every ring signature produces ambiguity as to how the flow value flowed between their addresses. Thus, you can't be certain which addresses send funds to another address. Depending on the size of the ring used for the signing, the ambiguity for a single transaction can vary from one out of two to one out of, uh, of a thousand. Every transaction increases the entropy and creates additional difficulty for the blockchain observer. Upcoming cypherpunk innovations. While there are still many privacy concerns for our cryptocurrency users, the future is bright due to the ongoing work of cypherpunks. The next step forward is pri in privacy will involve the use of zero knowledge proofs, which were first proposed in 1995 in order to broaden the potential applications of cryptographic proofs. Originally proposed by Dr. Back in 2013 as Bitcoins with homomorphic value, Maxwell has been working on confidential transactions which use zero-knowledge range proofs to enable the creation of Bitcoin transactions in which the values are hidden from everyone except the transaction participants. This is a great improvement on its own, but when you combine confidential transactions with coin join, then you can build a mixing service that severs any links between transaction inputs and outputs. When Maxwell presented sidechain elements at the uh, San Francisco Bitcoin Devs Meet, I recall him saying one of the greatest regrets held by the Greybeards at IETF is that the internet was not built with encryption as the default method of transmitting data. Maxwell clearly feels the same way about privacy in Bitcoin and wishes that we had confidential transactions from the very beginning. We have already seen Blockstream implement confidential transactions with the Liquid sidechain in order to manage transfers between exchanges. We also recently saw Maxwell conduct the first successful zero-knowledge contingent payment on the Bitcoin network. ZKCP is a transaction protocol that allows a buyer to purchase information from a seller using Bitcoin in a trustless manner. The purchase information is only transferred if the payment is made, and it is guaranteed to be transferred if the payment is made. The buyer and seller do not need to trust each other or depend on arbitration by a uh, third party. Essentially, it's a key that's in. I wrote about zero coin several years ago and noted the technique, technical challenges that it needed to overcome before the system could be usable. Since then, researchers have managed to take the, make the proofs much more efficient and have solved the trust problem with the initial generation of the system parameters. We are now on the cusp of seeing ZeroCoin's vision realized with the release of Zcash, headed by Wilcox O'Hearn. Zcash offers total payment confidentiality while still maintaining the decentralized network using a public blockchain. Zcash transactions automatically hide the sender, recipient, and value of all transactions on the blockchain. 
Only those with the correct view uh, key can see the contents of a transaction. Since the contents of Zcash transactions are encrypted and private, the system uses a novel cryptographic method to verify payments. Zcash uses a zero-knowledge proof construction called ZK Snark, developed by its team of ex experienced cryptographers. Instead of publicly demonstrating spend authority and transaction values, this transaction metadata is encrypted and ZK Snarks are used to prove that the transaction is valid. Zcash may very well be the first digital payment system that enables foolproof anonymity. Um, well, I mean, it might, but uh, but you have to give up perfectly binding. So you have no idea how many Zcash there are. And for all we know, there could be billions of Zcash because you can create it if you can um, subvert something, uh, some some of the underlying math. So, um, you know, the, this is the trade-off that you have to make if you want total anonymity. Putting the punk in cypherpunk. In the decades since the cypherpunks set forth on their quest, computer technology has advanced to the point where individuals and groups can communicate and inter interact with each other in a to totally anonymous manner. Two persons may exchange messages, conduct business, and negotiate electronic contracts without ever knowing the true name or legal identity of each other. Of the other. It is only natural that governments will try to slow or halt the spread of this technology, citing national security concerns, use of the technology by criminals, and fears of societal disintegration. Cypherpunks know that we must defend our privacy if we expect to have any. People have been defending their privacy for centuries with whispers, darkness, envelopes, closed doors, secret handshakes, and couriers. Prior, prior to the 20th century, technology did not enable strong privacy, but neither did it enable affordable math surveillance. We now live in a world where surveillance is to be expected, but privacy is not. Even though privacy-enhancing technologies exist, we have entered a phase that many are calling Crypto Wars 2.0. Although the cypherpunks emerge victorious from the crypto wars, uh, we cannot afford to rest upon our laurels. Zuko has experienced the failure of cypherpunk projects in the past, and he warns that failure is still possible. Cypherpunks believe that privacy is a fundamental human right, including privacy from governments. They understand that the weakening of a system's security for any reason, including access by trusted authorities, makes the system insecure for everyone who uses it. Cypherpunks write code. They know that someone has to write software to defend their privacy, and thus they take up the risk. They publish their code so that fellow cypherpunks may learn from it, attack it, and improve upon it. Their code is free for anyone to use. Cypherpunks don't care if you don't approve of the software they write. They know that software can't be destroyed and that widely dispersed systems can't be shut down. All right, so this is the uh, PGP signature. Um, hopefully that... Uh, That helps you, uh, you know, uh, hmm. I don't know if it, uh, yeah, I mean, there, I mean, Adam Bax obviously left, so yeah. Uh, anyway, that hopefully that helps you. Let me uh, just show my two books again. Uh, Little Bitcoin book, it's available in Spanish and Portuguese, um, Kindle and audio book. And of course, there is Programming Bitcoin. Um, if you want to learn how to code Bitcoin, that's, that's the book to get. Anyway, uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, Fiat Delenda asked, 